Welcome to Calvary Lutheran Church. May the word speak to you today, and may it loosen the grip that sin and evil has in your life, and set you free. We sing, God, who is almighty word. the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We sing bright and glorious is the sky. and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken, and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's reading is part of an update in the law for the Israelite community. As the people wait to enter the Promised Land, Moses assures the people that God will continue to guide them through prophets who will proclaim the Divine Word. And our first reading is from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you request the Lord your God at Horb on the day of the assembly, when you said, if I hear the voice of my Lord, my God, any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded, the prophet shall speak, that prophet shall die, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 111, if we will please read responsibly. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. 
You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Paul is concerned about the way some Corinthian Christians use their freedom in Christ as a license to engage in non-Christian behavior. This sets a damaging example to other impressionable believers. Christians have a responsibility that their behavior does not cause another to sin. And our second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though that there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause for their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. comes to us this day from St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. 
grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, who has the authority to bring life and salvation. Amen. Mark, in his Gospel account, has plunged us right into Jesus' ministry. He's rushed us through the baptism, the temptation by the devil, a touch of preaching announcing the coming of the kingdom, and Jesus calling some disciples. Now today, we have him teaching and healing, and we still have half of the first chapter to go. Mark is laying the groundwork in quick order. It is even made known with whom conflict will arise. Jesus goes into the synagogue and begins teaching. Now, the scribes were generally the ones who took on the task of teaching, providing their interpretation of the law. It would be impressed upon the people that their obedience was essential. Now, what do we hear about Jesus? He goes into the synagogue on this Sabbath and he taught as one having authority. Was it something in his presentation that wowed them? Perhaps his voice rang out with confidence and his explanations were given with clarity along with gentle empathy. Or was it something else? Perhaps in Jesus, the people heard one who was like the prophet described to Moses, who would lead the people following as Moses' true successor. For the Lord God had made this promise to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who will speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. As they began to put what they knew from their scriptures and what they were hearing from Jesus, this audience could begin to imagine and to hope that this was that one. This was the prophet foretold. So then, what he was telling them was straight from God, words that God had provided. I know you already knew that. You know that Jesus came with the very word of God. He was the word, made flesh. You know what the last chapter tells. It is about a certain Easter Sunday for the culmination of the story of Jesus has already been shared with you. So you realize that the authority spoken of is in fact divinely sourced. You've heard before Jesus claim that he did not come to do his own will, but rather the will of him who sent him. In other words, Jesus came to do the Father's bidding. The scribes did not have your advantage. What they could see was that Jesus was stepping on their toes. Here he was, taking up their role in the lives of the people. And Jesus was making an impression. He was being heard. And some were already following his lead. Into the middle of Jesus' teaching, as the listeners are absorbed by his insights, an annoying interruption distracts everyone. This unnamed man calls out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? That may very well have been the sentiment of the scribes. They just could not say it out loud. The people in the synagogue were probably not too surprised by this outburst. More than likely, they all knew this man and were used to his unpredictable ways. This man had not been well for some time. His mood swings and mannerisms were famil a familiar part of him. His demeanor was easily upset, but they certainly hoped that Jesus would not be put off or angered by his boisterous, rude behavior and loud voice. 
It is explained that this man has an unclean spirit, something over which he had no control. That spirit recognizes that it is in danger, and so it asks Jesus, has he come to destroy it? There is also this claim made, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's always interesting to note who has understanding and who remains in the dark. Jesus comprehends that this man is not himself. Another spirit is dominating him and has taken over his personality. He knows this man is subjected against his will. But Jesus is also known for who he is. I know you, that name, the Holy One of God, has been applied before to the prophet Elisha. Elisha was well remembered for being instrumental in bringing the Shunammite woman's son back to life in 2 Kings. He was a man of God who utilized God's power to conquer the demonic powers of death. Jesus is seen being likened to Elisha and he also takes on the unclean and demons who represent death and overcomes them by means of the power of light and life. Rebuking that which was unclean, Jesus said, be silent and come out of him. Like the prophet that was expected, Jesus speaks the word he is given and the man is healed. Jesus has freed him from that which had oppressed him. The reaction of the witnesses is great amazement and even a greater admiration for the authority that has been demonstrated by Jesus. For then it reinforced the authority shown through his teaching. As for the command for silence, we can appreciate this as we look at the understanding that this culture had concerning the name. The one who possessed the name could utilize the authority of the one being named. It was more than not wanting one's strongest witness to come from one's enemy. It was a matter of access to power. It is in fact why when we pray, when we ask for forgiveness, when we bless, we invoke the name of Jesus Christ. The name and the authority are interwoven. We have a comparable concern about naming. When we have fear that we need to face and defeat, we believe it should be named. Once we know what causes our anxiety or stress, then we have a much better chance of defeating it. We could even term these troublesome challenges as demons. We need to name our demons. On an individual level, the demon could be an addiction, an obsessive behavior. For others, it might be a disease. For some, it is a handicap. For others, it could be a personality trait or a bad habit. Within community, there are other struggles that afflict us as demons in our midst. Intolerance to the ideas and convictions of others. Violence. Systemic poverty, greed, racism, sexism, and the list seems endless. Naming the demons is a way to bring them into the light and admit that they exist around us and even within us. Once we recognize that we are what we are dealing with, then we can move on to the next step. Jesus would have us do as he did at every opportunity. Pray. Praying is not an activity that is just to fill time and make us feel as if we can take that concern off of our own list of things to do because we've moved it to God's to-do list. Prayer is our struggle with looking at that which we fear looking the demon in the eye as we name it, and then 
consider what it is God would have us do. It is listening and looking to the ultimate authority for support and direction. Prayer is laying out our hope that change can happen and seeing that there is something we can do to help it along. Prayer is our way of putting our faith in the authority of Jesus and then to follow where he leads. Today, we will be praying for individuals who each have demons that oppress them. We will ask that they be set free in the name of Jesus. Amen. Join us in the litany of healing. O oh Lord, we come in response to your invitation, asking for your attention to our needs. We seek healing for our friends and for ourselves, and for the restoration of relationships. We want to be reached by your steadfast love, so we can again be well and whole in your presence. Since our hearts and minds have been tainted by the world, we have been scarred and broken. These encounters have made us weary, distrustful, and weighed down by many burdens. We need you to lift us up and hold us close. Protect us, Lord, from the dangers that await. Even as we must admit that we fall short of your expectations of us. We come trusting in your grace, accepting your forgiveness, and warmed by your compassion. So, Lord God, we offer to you our praise and bring you prayers regarding particular need. Jesus, you made yourself known, especially by your compassionate healing. So we ask you to look today upon the faith of these people seeking prayers for themselves and for others. Touch them with your healing. Make your presence known and fill them with strength and courage to deal with the challenges presented by their body, mind, and circumstances. We pray for Mary Kramer in Jesus' name, asking that her liver cancer treatment be effective. We pray for Harvey Miller in Jesus' name. We ask that his broken hip heal fully and that rehab returns him to an active life. We pray for Virginia Latza, in Jesus' name, that treatment for her lung cancer give her hope and courage in the difficult time ahead. We pray for Art Bowden in the name of Jesus as he deals with an erratic heartbeat. 
May the doctors determine a treatment that will work for him. In the name of Jesus, we pray for Keith Stephan, Donna's brother-in-law, as he already has lost his left leg due to gangrene and now the toes on his right foot. We ask that doctors are enabled to save the rest of his foot and leg. For Perry Dow, we pray in Jesus' name as you, O Lord, consider his cancers. We give thanks for the recent progress with new medicine and ask for its continued efficacy. We pray for Jill Lemke and for all that are plagued by COVID-19. May the symptoms remain manageable for her and healing come swiftly. We pray for Tom Thompson in Jesus' name. We ask that his bladder problems be determined and a successful treatment be provided. We pray for Barb Thompson in Jesus' name for the concerns that she could develop bladder cancer. May the doctors continue their vigilance and provide her healing. For Tammy Dwyer, we pray in Jesus' name that he provide her continued strength and courage for the work of rehab so she may be restored to health and wholeness. And we also pray that the grief of this family at the loss of her brother, Christian Iverson, find peace and comfort in Christ. For Betty Oldenburg, we pray in Jesus' name, asking that he walks with her in her battle with anxiety and her fears over the weak condition of her bones. Give her the determination to go forward and find relief. In the name of Jesus, we pray for Vernon Jan's granddaughters, who are both undergoing cancer treatments. Be with Brittany Studermint and Kelsey Colson. Bring these young women healing. In the name of Jesus, we pray for a troubled son and his heartbroken mother. May his heart be softened and find empathy so that a reconciliation may come between the two of them. For Al Bauman, we pray in Jesus' name, as his struggle with cancer and other health issues continues, may the treatments provide life. We bring before your presence all these named individuals and those not named. You know what is truly needful, Lord, so we ask that you provide this and more. May your guidance and your healing be known in their lives. Amen. We continue with prayers of the people, guided by Christ made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Have, Have mercy, mercy, O God. For all God's work in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exists, let us pray. Have, Have mercy, O oh God. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, let us pray. Have, Have mercy, O oh God. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, especially those for whom special prayers have been offered, and those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and all in need, for caregivers, hospital, hospice workers, and home health aides, let us pray. Have, have mercy, mercy, O God. God. For the covenant God made with each of us in the waters of baptism and in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, let us pray. 
Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. We take an offering moment. We thank you for the offerings provided in envelopes or sent through bank accounts, however they come. We are blessed with over 200 cans of soup and looking for more to be passed along through our backpack program and the food pantry distribution. May all your shared gifts be multiplied by their use. We come before our Lord. Blessed are you, O holy God. You are the life and light of all. By your powerful word, you created all things. Through the prophets, you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your son. He is your light, shining in our darkness and revealing to us your mercy and might. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his preaching and healing, his dying and rising, and his promise to come again, we await that day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your Spirit, bless this meal, that refreshed with this heavenly food we may be light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your church, both now and forever. Amen. And together we pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ, at this table, we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Keep you in peace. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.